So the couple sitting in your office, she's got her arms crossed with a scowl on her face. He's sitting across from her, he's got his legs crossed, and he's looking anywhere but at her. From there, the action ensues, and they're having it out right there in your office, and you're just kind of sitting there going, what in the world is happening? Where is this going? What is wrong in this whole thing? But finally, somewhere in the midst of all of it, you hear this one sentence. Angrily, she says, you should have blank, and I will let you fill that in with whatever you want because it's not important. What's important is my ears perked up at that moment, and I said, ah, there is an expectation, and it hasn't been fulfilled. We have an expectation problem on our hands, and we've talked about expectations before in other series, and I've always kind of summarized it like this. I've said, when I said I do, I sort of expected you would. That's, sort of, that's kind of how you summarize expectations in a marriage. But I have learned in the past two to three years in particular that there's a third sentence to this that keeps creeping up each time I'm talking with folks. And so while, yes, when I say I do, I sort of expected you would, there's always this last line that says, even if I haven't communicated it. Figure it out. And this one gets us in trouble more often than not. Welcome to week two of Matters of the Heart. We're talking about expectations this week. But as I said, this is not a marriage series. This is a relationship series. Because come to find out, while marriage is sometimes where we see it uh, the most angrily, expectations occur in every relationship out there. No matter the relationship, there's some expectations built into it. In fact, it can happen at work as well. This happened to me a couple of weeks ago, and I, I got the staff's permission to tell this story. It's great. But we were sitting in staff meeting, and, and one of my staff, who I've been asking for years to step up and teach one time, she finally said, you know what, the, the Lord's been really tugging at my heart and woke me up last night, and I, I think I've got to teach for the Good Friday service. And I said, Praise the Lord. Uh, that's great. We got you down. But afterwards, and I'm in the parking lot trying to go home, one of my other employees stops me and says, uh, Jason, I'm just really disappointed that you didn't ask me to teach on Good Friday. And I stopped. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Did we talk about that? And did I forget? I've been really busy lately, and I'm so sorry. And he goes, oh no, I've never told you. <laughs> and I'm not naming names, Nick. Uh <laughs> <laughs> on this one. <laughs> but you can only imagine what's going in my head at that moment, because I'm guessing it's going to yours too. Like, was I supposed to just divine that? Uh, I mean, do I have ESP? What, how was I supposed to figure that out? You know, but that happens sometimes. There's these unspoken uh, expectations that slip into a relationship. And so as we dive into our conversation about expectations today, there's four expectations in particular I want to highlight, and it's good for us to understand there's some nuances, some differences between each of these. These are on your fill-ins if you want to follow along with your notes today. We've got quite a few, and I think these are important uh, to follow along with. The first kind of expectation we run into sometimes is what I call mismatched expectations. One party comes into the relationship with their set of goals, their set of expectations. The other party comes into it with their goals and expectations, and they don't align. And that's when trouble ensues and when you have to sit down, you have to talk through it, work through it, and figure some things out. You've got mismatched expectations. The next one is called unmet expectations. And, and this is one where maybe you do have some agreed upon standards or, or goals, but what the other party isn't keeping their end of the bargain, or at least it doesn't seem so to you. They're not stepping up to the plate. So you have mismatched expect or unmet, excuse me, expectations. The third one we just talked about, and that's unstated expectations. That's where one party has assumed expectations, but they fail to communicate those expectations with the other party, or they don't communicate it well. And then at that point, we've just got a communication problem, uh, or they're just flat out not stated, which is a problem. 
The fourth one we need to pay attention to as well, and that is unrealistic expectations. And these are expectations that the other party is unlikely to be able to achieve no matter what. And you know what? There's various ways that we have unrealistic expectations. Sometimes we put those on our kids. Sometimes we put those on our staff or our employees at work. It can happen just about anywhere. And all relationships, as I said, have expectations. So your family relationships, there's expectations. At work, there's expectations you have. In friendships with people, there's expectations. But here, let me meddle just a little bit with the fourth one. You have expectations with God as well. And that last one's a biggie. What happens when you have expectations of God and you don't think he has met them? Is it okay to get angry with God at those times or to wrestle through it? We may have to preach a whole sermon on that one at some point. <laughs> and I want to clarify, there's absolutely nothing wrong with expectations. It might seem like today I'm dogging on them and, I, and I'm not. At the core, expectations are about hope. When you have an expectation, it is your hope for something better in the relationship or in someone else. It carries with it this, this hope, and none of us want to be in a hopeless relationship, so having hope in your relationship and expectations that help reach that is good. It motivates us to have a better relationship. However, a couple things can creep in if we're not careful with unhealthy expectations, and that is, A, that we're not aware of our expectations. Did you know you have expectations? You may not even be aware that you have them. Or, as we've said several times, and I'm going to keep saying, because this one's the one that keeps creeping up the most, we don't communicate those expectations to the other party. And when these things happen, we run into relationship issues. We, we have tension. And so to be clear, as we start today, every person enters into a relationship with expectations. Even if they are unclear, unrealized, like I said, you may not even realize you have some of these expectations, or unstated. The real question becomes, how aware of your expectations in life are you? Are you aware that you have expectations, and if you're aware that you have expectations, what are they? You may have to step back and do a personal inventory in your life. You may have to sit down and talk with the other party, whatever it may be, to fully understand that. Because chances are, every single day you go out into the world with dozens, if not hundreds, of these known and unknown expectations in your life. And by the way, you have expectations on people you know, and whether you realize it or not, you have expectations on complete strangers as well. You carry these expectations with you everywhere you go. And yet we all feel disappointment when other people don't meet the expectations that we have set. Whether they know it or not. You ever found yourself resentful of somebody? You don't understand why, you just know you're angry, you're uncomfortable. It's causing your relationship to suffer, it's getting worse. You're sad, you're hurt, you're disappointed. And like all pressure cookers, it can only take so much. As the pressure increases, 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 at some point that thing's going to blow. And if we're not careful, that's what happens in our relationships too. They just build and they build and they build. But have you ever stopped long enough to step back in those relationships where you're confused, you, you don't understand it, you just know there's tension, you're angry, it's building? Have you ever stopped to step, long enough to take a step back and go, this might be due to my expectations, and I need to evaluate them in this situation? And I've seen this play out in fun ways recently. Not everything has to be serious. I mean, I was talking with, with one wife, and she was just frustrated. She's like, my husband doesn't do anything with the laundry. It's driving me bananas. I'm like, have you talked to him about it? She's like, no. <sighs> well, go talk to him about it. Tell him what you're thinking. And so she did. And come to find out, whether you agree with it or not, his answer was simply, I just thought you enjoyed doing laundry. No kidding. 
She didn't. (laughs) But as they sat down and they talked about it, they came to terms with, hey, he's going to do this part, she's going to do this part, here's when they're going to do their part. And they came to a consensus on how to handle the laundry after that. Go figure. Another person I, I talked to recently, they started dating a girl. And um, they were frustrated after like the second date or so, and they were just talking to me over some lunch, and I'm like, man, I just, it, it's driving me crazy. I have to instigate all of the text messages and email or however, phone calls, whatever it is. Like, I'm always the one that has to start the conversation. She never does that, and it's driving me bananas, but I really like her. She's hot, you know, whatever it may be. <laughs> and I'm like, well, have you talked to her about it? No. Talk to her about it. Next time you go on a date, just say, hey, how come I'm always the one that has to send out the first text, whatever? And you know what? And he did talk to her. And come to find out, you know, again, whether you agree with her or not, she had been raised in a home that at this point in the relationship, it was the man's job to instigate the first communications and to step it forward. But he didn't know that. But as they talked it out, got a good laugh out of it, they moved forward and they're still dating to this day but they had to talk it through. And that's why I give you this very almost overly simple statement. For a person to have any chance of meeting your expectations, you have to tell them what those expectations are. And you say, that's so simple, Pastor Jason. I'm going to say, you're absolutely right. So why aren't most of you doing it? If you don't tell them, there's hardly any chance of your needs getting met. And there's a high probability they're going to get disappointed. It's just going to happen. Another pastor once noted, and I thought this was great, he says, you cannot hold people accountable for unspoken, unrealistic expectations. Now, before we go any further, I do want to kind of give you a quick caveat, a time out for a second, and differentiate two things for just a moment. There is a difference in your relationship between expectations and preferences. These are not the same thing. And I just want to show you the difference a little bit. Expectations are strong beliefs that something will happen. I believe this is going to happen, should happen, and is going to happen. And if circumstances don't go a particular way, I'm not going to be okay. A preference, on the other hand, is a strong liking for something. I prefer it that way. And if circumstances don't go a particular way, I will be okay. And you're going to have all kinds of preferences in your relationships and and in your marriage. My wife prefers to burn popcorn down to a charcoal crisp. I prefer not to smell burnt microwave popcorn in the house for the next two hours. But that is a preference, not a deal breaker. My wife prefers hot showers. And we have the kind of shower at our house that when you turn it on, it goes right back to the spot where the last person who used it is. (laughs) And when I say hot shower, my wife prefers a cauldron of burning hot metal poured directly onto her skin. (laughs) So imagine my surprise when I get in the shower, turn it on, and maybe you have seen the original Indiana Jones movie where their faces are melting. That's me! I'm like, who in the world takes a shower this hot? That's a preference, though. Not a deal breaker. I prefer to be 10 minutes early to meetings. My wife prefers to get there when she feels like it. It's just the uniqueness of your marriages and just the idiosyncrasies and they're, in the end, their preferences. Are there expectations? Yeah. She expects that I'm not going to have a woman on the side and that's a good expectation. She expects that I'm not watching porn. Sorry to stomp on some toes out there. It's a good expectation. It's adultery. But there's a difference between expectations and preferences in our marriage. And this is where I want to take a step back, if I could, and talk about a more serious expectation. And I want everyone to relax for a minute. But sometimes my job 
is to talk about tough things. And this is one I want to talk about. Did you know people have expectations of church as well? And there's one particular expectation that has landed on my plate a lot the last two years. And, and to be fair, this is not a radiant problem. I know dozens of pastors and every single one of them are struggling with this. So this is an American church issue, not a radiant issue on this. But when there's an elephant in the room, we've got to call it out sometimes. And here's that expectation. Take a deep breath. I expect to make friends at church. And it's a totally valid thing. It's totally valid. And if, and if people are feeling it, then those feelings are real. Maybe that's you. And I believe that this feeling and this desire is driven by good things. It's a genuine desire to find a place filled with loving, warm, welcoming people who hold similar values and a desire to do life together with them. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good expectation. The reality is, is loneliness is one of the most powerful emotions I know of out there. It makes people do things they never would do. And the irony we all know is that we've never been more connected today than ever before, and yet loneliness is just completely on the rise. People are lonelier now than ever. What's going on? So this desire to connect, to have friends, to meet people, it's a God-given desire. It's not selfish. It was put into our DNA. Genesis 2.18, it clearly says, it says, the Lord God says, it is not good for man to be alone. It's literally been put into who you are. God put this need for us to have healthy, dynamic, loving, vulnerable, transparent relationships. It's built into who you are. Does everyone find one at Radiant, though? Nope. It doesn't always happen. It could be many reasons for it, but one of the reasons we talked about with expectations is I, I think that sometimes, as, as a culture, we have unrealistic expectations, so I just want to call a few of those out today, if I could. What are some unrealistic expectations? And then we'll talk about some steps we can take. One of the unrealistic expectations is this, that friendships come naturally. They don't. I mean, maybe once every blue moon. By and large, they, they don't. We don't always naturally gravitate towards each other. Two, two of my best friends in life are my roommates for college, but had we not been forced to be roommates, I don't know that we would have chosen it. You know what I mean? But it happened over time. Making friends requires intentionality, and, and listen, hear me on this, hard work. If you're lazy, it ain't gonna work, okay? It's hard work to make friends. It really is. And you've got to be intentional about it. You can't just float around in life hoping that a friend's going to land on you. Doesn't happen. The next one kind of goes with it. Str strong relationships happen quickly. They don't. In fact, Pastor Ben sent me a great figure this week, and it said that studies show it can take up to 200 hours or more to become close friends. 200 hours or more. Ben and I have spent thousands of hours together, and we still don't like each other. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> We're actually very good friends. <laughs> but when I met my wife, yeah, we were attracted to each other and liked each other a lot. But it took... Hours, weeks, and months for that friendship to truly build. There's a difference between infatuation and a friendship. The third one, everyone will be my friend. No, they won't. And if you would like to experience that firsthand, I invite you to become the lead pastor of a church. <laughs> nope, they won't. Sometimes the chemistry's just off. And chemistry's real, guys, I'm sorry. I have the four C's anytime I'm hiring somebody, character, competency, chemistry, and calling. 
I always tell you that chemistry one's the most important one. It's hard. And it's really real because if you've ever had a team and you brought the wrong person in on the team, they can destroy a team. They can. Sometimes we think that everyone's going to be our friends and they're just not going to. It's unrealistic to think that's going to be the case. And by the way, it might not have anything to do with you. In this case and in this idea, it might not. People are hurt. And by the way, hurting people hurt other people. That's just what they do. But you might run into somebody, they just got junk, trust issues, abuse, anger, all kinds of things in their life. And you're like, they don't like me. They don't want to be my friend. The truth is, it's them. And you put it on yourself as if, like somehow whether or not I make a friend is how I determine whether or not I have a healthy self-consciousness in my life. And I wouldn't do that. Sometimes the chemistry is just off, okay? Now, before we put the last one up, before we put the last one up, I almost didn't put this one in because this is where it gets tough. This one's where it really gets tough. But I gotta, we got to talk about it. I lack self-awareness. What does that mean? That's EQ as opposed to IQ. This is emotional code. This is your ability to see yourself as other people see you and as God sees you and to discern the difference. All of us, by the way, struggle in some way, shape, or form with self-awareness. Every single one of us, just in varying levels. These are social personality flaws that prevent us from connecting with other people. What those look like? Well, it can be abrasiveness, it, gossip, where you're talking about people behind their back. Slander, you're not only talking about them behind their back, you're scissoring them behind their back. Judgmentalism. It, it, and here's the hardest one. And my staff has always asked me, is there like one line in the sand where we cross this one and we're done? Yep, here it is. An unteachable spirit, which requires humility. But I can't do anything with somebody that has an unteachable spirit, except put up boundaries. All of these just fall under the category of just general toxicity. And people that lack self-awareness don't see what others see, and they get frustrated when the people don't lean in as a result. And for you to become self-aware, it's going to require that you sit down with highly trusted people, highly trusted people in your life, or get some professional help in this case, like a counselor, and evaluate what are those areas in my life that are keeping me from connecting with others and forming deep relationships with them. Or maybe in that list I listed off, a couple of them you went ouch and ouch, and maybe you kind of know which ones to step into. Whatever it may be, becoming self-aware takes a lot of hard work, intentionality, humility, and trusted people around you. It's hard to admit, hey, I might be the reason I'm not making friends. I want you to have and experience deep, loving friendships here at Radiant Church. I really do. I, I ache for it, and I want us to be a family. This is the very thing that keeps me up at night. It does. But what I don't have is a magic wand to make you automatically friends with other people. I just don't have it. I also realize too, that we need to keep focused on one thing about church and not lose sight of it. While, yes, I want us to have deep friendships and be a family, realize that church also is an equipping center for those who have been called out of the world and are created to be lights in the world, which is don't lose sight of the mission of the church and don't put being a country club above your calling. Ouch. Yes, I want that, but our primary goal here is to be a light in the world and to bring the love of Christ into our community seven days a week. That's why we exist primarily. Don't lose sight of that. A church is not meant to be a country club. It is meant to be an equipping center.
for the disciples. But if you want to step in and, and, and say, I'd like to be more intentional and I'd like to do some of the hard work of making friends, what are some simple things I can do? And let's hear my heart on this. This, this, this set of things are A, simple, and B, they're not self-serving. I'm not just trying to get you to do some of these because that'd be good for us. It's just, they just, it's what I know works in 20-something years of ministry. What are those things? Number one, try to come to church each week. No judgment. It's just that if you look at me and go, yeah, I come three or four times a year, but I'm not making friends, what do you think I'm going to say? Use some common sense. Step outside of your friend group. Now, I went to high school, and I'm guessing a bunch of you did, and my high school had cliques. I don't know what you call them today or back then. I know we had the jocks. We had the band nerds. Guess which one I wasn't. <laughs> we had what I called the trench coat mafia. <laughs> These are people that wore all black <laughs> all the time. There were just different groups and there were cliques and that was high school, you know what I mean? But we're not in high school anymore. We're not meant to just hang out with only the people we like or are like us. So here's the hard one. I mean, if at the end of church you typically talk to the same people each week, you might be in a clique. And if we're going to make friends and grow and become the family I want us to be, you're going to have to step outside of your safe friend group, walk across a room, shake someone's hand, and ask them some questions about themselves. Get to know them. Like I said, I don't have a magic wand. And I need you all to do that. You got to go talk to folks. The next one, get plugged into a small group. You can't meet everybody in this environment. The best way that I know people go into close relationships, and we have some really strong groups here at Radiant Church. I mean, several. In fact, one group is so strong that at my Pleasant Hill campus, I'm literally missing 30-something people today because they're all off on a cruise, <laughs> of which I did not accurately communicate my preference for them to take me. <laughs> and I will do a better job next time. And between them and our snowbirds has created a third radiant campus in South Florida. <laughs> but that small group loves each other and has built such great friendships that they, they're going on vacations together now. And there's others as well. I want that for all of you. Serve. Again, it's not a plug just to get you to serve. Although I quite guarantee kids ministry would appreciate me telling you that they need help. That's been amening in the back. <laughs> but there's something about serving other people that helps you feel like you belong. It's just true. And when you serve, you also become part of a, a group of people that do life together, almost a little bit of a small group. And if you ever want a great example of that, hang out with our tech team and our setup teardown team. It's how they get connected. Next one, invite someone out to lunch. It's so simple. I didn't say go pay for them, set that expectation right away. <laughs> Pay for them if you want to. But there's, it's not magical. There's just something incredible that happens when people just sit down, talk to each other over food. I don't know what it is. And you know what? Football season's over. San Francisco won. I get it. <laughs> That'll get a few communications. Uh, <laughs> but you got the time. You got an hour after church to go lunch with somebody. It's a simple thing, but it's powerful. I've, I've, I've got great relations with people that started over lunch. And the last one seems so easy, and it's not very eloquent. I know how else to say it. Do something with others. Go to a concert. Go to a sporting event. I don't know, walk around the mall. Whatever it may be. Anything but sitting at home going, why am I alone? Do 
something. I believe we can do this, but, but as we've said, it takes a little bit of hard work and intentionality. It just does. People aren't just going to land in your sphere of influence. They're just not going to. So you've got to ask yourself, what's my next step? What am I going to do? But I believe absolutely we can do this if we're all saying, hey, we got to do it. I've got to break out of my comfort zone. I've got to walk across the room. I've got to shake a hand. So let's wrap this up. Mismatched, unmet, unstated, or unrealistic, unrealistic expectations are the silent killers of any relationship. Any one of these creep in, and there's a problem. And if you're feeling angry or resentful in a relationship, take a step back and evaluate your expectations. Have I communicated them? Are they unrealistic? Write them down, talk it over, get some help. But ignoring unhealthy expectations and hoping they go away or pretending they're not there is only going to make your relationship worse and it will eventually destroy it every single time. You hear me on that? That's how important expectations and communicating them and understanding them in a relationship is. So you have to ask yourself, are there any unhealthy expectations I have in a relationship and what's my next step? Wrestle with that this week so that we can be a church and a group of people living in freedom but who also love each other and are building a family because there's so many people out there, y'all, that need to know Jesus and we need a healthy church shining their light in the community if we're going to live out the calling that I believe God has called Radiant to do.